Life is not worth living. Gandhi fasted. Mother Jones threatened to pick it. Buddha chanted, oh. Mark Twain even came to my defense in his own strange way. And the others kept quiet. My God, at this point, what have they got to lose? <laughs> yes, there too I have a reputation as a troublemaker. And there too, protest works. Finally, they said, all right, you can go. You can have an hour or so to speak your mind. But remember, no agitating. They do believe in freedom of speech, but within limits. They are liberals. <laughs> so you can spread the word. Marx is back. But understand one thing. I am not a Marxist. <laughs> I once said that to Peeper, and he almost croaked. I should tell you about Peeper. We were living in London at the time, Jenny and I and the little ones, two dogs, three cats, two birds, hardly living, a little flat on Dean Street, right near where they dumped the city sewage. We were in London because I had been expelled from the continent, expelled from the Rhineland, yes, from my birthplace. I had done dangerous things. I was the editor of a newspaper, the Rheinische Zeitung. Hardly a revolutionary, although I suppose the most revolutionary act one can engage in is to tell the truth. You see, the police were arresting poor people for gathering firewood from the estates of the rich. I wrote an editorial protesting that. They decided to censor our newspaper. I wrote an editorial declaring there was no freedom of the press in Germany. They decided to prove me right. <laughs> and they shut us down. Isn't that the way it is? You know, then we became radical. <laughs> Our final issue of Zeitung had a huge headline in red ink, REVOLT. <laughs> that annoyed the authorities. <laughs> they ordered me out of the Rhineland. So we went to Paris. Where else do exiles go? <laughs> Where else can you stay up all night and drink wine and tell lies about how revolutionary you were in the old country? <laughs> yes, if you're going to be in exile, be one in Paris. Paris was our honeymoon. Uh, Jenny found a tiny flat in the Latin Quarter. Heavenly months. Heavenly months. But soon, the word was out. From the German police to the Paris police. Seems the police develop an internationalist consciousness long before the workers. Um, <clears throat> the... Um, the doctors said the cough would go away in a few weeks. That was in 1858. <laughs> so anyway, I was telling you about Peeper. You see, in London, the political refugees from the world marched in and out of our house. Peeper was one of them. He was a flatterer, a sycophant. He buzzed around me like a hornet. He would station himself six inches from me so that I could not evade him, and he would quote from my writings. I used to say, Peeper, please do not quote me to myself. <laughs> he had the audacity to say, thinking I would be pleased, that he would translate Das Kapital into English. <laughs> the man could not speak one sentence of English without butchering it. English is a beautiful language. It is Shakespeare's language. If Shakespeare had heard Peeper speak one sentence of English... He would have taken poison. Jenny felt sorry for him. She used to like to invite him to our family dinners. One evening, he came over and he announced the formation of the Marxist Society of London. A, a, a Marxist society, I asked. Um, what's that? He said, we meet every week to discuss another of your writings. We read aloud and examine sentence by sentence. That's why we call ourselves Marxists. We believe completely and wholeheartedly in everything you've ever written. Completely and wholeheartedly, I asked. Yes, and we would be honored, Herr Dr. Marx. He always called me Mr. Dr. Marx. I don't know. If you would address the next meeting of the Marxist Society... 
I cannot do that. <laughs> Why not? Because I am not a Marxist. <laughs> I didn't mind his bad English. Mine wasn't always so perfect. It was his way of thinking. It was an embarrassment. A satellite encircling my words, reflecting them to the world, but distorting them, and then defending the distortions like a fanatic, denouncing anyone who interpreted them differently. I used to say to Jenny, do you know what I fear most? She would say that the workers' revolution will never come. But I said, no. The revolution will come, but when it does, it will be taken over by men like paper. Flatterers when out of power, bullies and braggarts when holding power, dogmatists. They will speak for the proletariat. They will interpret my ideas for the world. They'll organize a new hierarchy, a new priesthood, with excommunications and indexes, inquisitions and firing squads, all in the name of communism. You muck up our beautiful dream. And it will take another revolution, maybe two or three, to clean it up. That's what I fear. No, I was not going to have Pieper translate Das Kapital. It represented 15 years of work in the conditions of Soho, making my work. Was somebody trying to take a part of the gross domestic product illegally from those who have stolen it legally? <laughs> oh, the wonders of the market system! Human beings reduced to commodities, their lives controlled by the super commodity money! The committee doesn't like that. 